Kia ora, welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. My name's Francis Cook, I'm the Investments Editor at Business Desk, and we have a great Business Desk special for listeners and viewers. You can find out about it at the end of this episode. But before we get started, here's some important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Today, we're joined by Greg Foran, who is the CEO of Air New Zealand. Welcome, Greg. Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming in. Now, you joined the airline February 2020, right before everything tipped upside down. Fair to say you've steered them through challenging times. Feels like you're coming into a new phase for the airline. Is that what you feel that you're coming into now as well? Yes, I, uh, I I would describe it as that. I and you know in our in our communications with our team, we often refer to it as sort of three phases: sort of survive, revive, thrive. Mm -hmm. And really, those first couple of years were about surviving. Um, you know, we really weren't doing a lot of flying, and then of course we've revived. And you would have to say, based on the last six months' result, we're starting to get into the early stages of Thrive. Mm. How has that changed your role and what the business needs from you as the business has moved through those phases? Yeah, quite a lot, to be honest with you. So, you know, in between this being a, a new role, a new industry for me to learn, you've, of course, got the survival period where effectively your revenue disappears almost overnight mm. and you've got to deal with all the issues around a P&L and a balance sheet. Then, you know, during a revival phase, which was sort of on again, off again, pause, reset, start, um, you've got this mix of getting a capital raise underway and completed. Um, and then the beginnings of restarting an airline and and all the things that are associated with that. And of course, at the moment, um, things are, are very much in our favour. You know, you've you've got a situation where lots of people looking to get out and explore not just New Zealand and the world. And, you know, I would say we're a bit clunky at the moment as we restart this airline at some pace. Yeah. Talk to me about that capital raise uh, a little bit. And how it went, did it achieve what you wanted it to? Yes, it did. And, um, you know, it was a reasonably long time in terms of, if you like, cooking mm -hmm. this this particular raise up. And that was appropriate because things were changing so quickly. You know, if you reflect back in early 2020, we all started to learn a lot about COVID. And I think most people had a view that this would go on for several months and run its course and then we'd be back up and running. So, you know, we were creating forecasts and scenarios based on that. And then, of course, what we learned over the next, not just 12 months, but in fact, 24 plus months, mm -hmm. is we had to deal with something that was going to be a lot more complex and longer. And it turned out... Um, to be actually quite advantageous to go to the market when we did, which is almost exactly a year ago, you know, the end of March, because by then we had some more surety around border reopenings. We were starting to understand a lot more about how this virus would play out. And so therefore that allowed us to be a bit more precise in terms of how much capital we would raise, a combination of equity and debt, mm -hmm. uh, how we would go about doing that, um, how it would be constructed. And I think the team did a terrific job and it was a big team. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're very pleased now with the financial surety that we find ourselves in, in terms of a balance sheet. I know it's funny that you mentioned there about people thinking it would only take a few months because I, I remember people rebooking holidays for June of 2020, which looking back on seems hopelessly naive, but also, to be fair to people, we'd never dealt with something like this before. So now coming into it, we know so much more about how things play out and we have a lot more understanding of how it all works. Um, it's just a totally different game plan. Let's dig into your results. 
You recently reported pre-tax earnings of $299 million for the six months to December 31. Congratulations. You must be pleased with that. It's not bad, especially when you consider it was a loss of $376 million the same time previous year. So what turned things around? Yeah, look, so first of all, we are we are pleased with it. You know, we ended up losing over that period oh, over $1.2 billion. To, so, you know, so to be able to come in with almost $300 million pre-tax is good. Mm. Um, you know, it's a reasonable return on invested capital. And I, and I go to that number because we should bear that in mind when we think about Air New Zealand. It's a business that is a reasonably high cost business to run. You know, 299 million, pay your tax, you're just over a couple of hundred million. It's about the price of, buy, of that we pay for, for buying one Dreamliner. So you need to generate a profit to continue to invest in the business. It ended up being about our fourth best result, um, but we had to work hard at it. And bear in mind that was achieved with about 65, 70% of our capacity and with higher fuel prices. Now, certainly we did have higher pricing supporting us. So, you know, we're pleased with it. It's a good result. It's a start. Mm. And now we just have to continue this momentum. Well, exactly, because that leads to an investor question sent through by one of the Shazzy's investors. Will those earnings results be sustained? Well, you know, clearly what we want to do is continue to deliver a very consistent result going forward. But, you know, it is interesting because it's still quite volatile in terms of how all of this plays out. We certainly know quite a lot more about COVID, but there are plenty of other factors that are still going to come our way, whether it be the price of fuel, whether it will be, you know, issues around the world and how orderly that occurs. We're obviously dealing with a reasonably high inflation um, perspective at the moment that impacts us just the same way it impacts someone in their house. You know, we we have to get catering, um, so we're buying food and, you know, that went up by 38% for us um, over the last six months. Uh, fuel was up 58%. So we're dealing with all those things. But you know, my sense of, of how things are feeling at the moment is there's certainly still pretty good demand out there for people to travel. Um, we're cognizant that, that pricing is up, that economically things will be a bit tougher. Uh, we want to get a bit more capacity out there because we know that's one of the ways that brings prices down. So we've got a couple more triple sevens that we want to get back flying. We actually have one in, in the desert at the moment that's about to head to Singapore to get um, you know, reanimated so we can get that up and running. We've brought in some more air buses with, you know, more seats on it because we know getting a few more seats out there help, helps bring the prices down. And you'll also see a bit more competition come back in the marketplace. But having said that, overall, I think it's quite rational at the moment considering how volatile the situation is. So is that your main strategy for dealing with those rising costs to get more planes in, to get more bums and seats and to really get passenger numbers through and up? Yeah, that is actually one of the key levers for getting pricing down. You know, I said before we're running at about 65% capacity and that was at the half. Now, every single week, every single month, we're getting some more seats out there and you're getting more competition into the marketplace. So the more seats that are out there, the more supply there is, mm -hmm. that deals with the fact that demand is quite hot and the prices start coming down. And you might sort of say, well, you know, why don't you just cap the prices and, and don't let anyone pay too much? Because, mm -hmm. boy, that would be a good customer strategy. And the answer to that is, for some, mm -hmm. that is a good strategy. For others, they'll actually be disappointed because they might not be able to get a seat. And they may well say to Air New Zealand, hey, I was prepared to pay X amount of dollars to fly from here to here at late notice because I needed to get there because there was a funeral or there was a wedding or there was something that I had to go to. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why pricing in airlines tends to operate like it does. If you buy later, you pay a bit more Having said that, I'm very cognizant that 
we do have some good tailwinds with prices. That won't last mm -hmm. forever. Um, and the best way to deal with it is get some capacity back back into the market. Well, it's it's interesting that you mentioned prices because, of course, after you announced that very good result, you then faced some accusations of price gouging. What did you make of those? Well, I dislike the word, to be honest with you, because I don't think we do. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's reflective of what occurs in the market just at the moment. You know, first of all, every airline, not just Air New Zealand, is trying to get back on its feet. And of course, it's not just a matter of the airline getting back on its feet. It's also the entire ecosystem that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of MPI getting back on its feet, aviation security, air traffic control, caterers, supply chain for parts, all of these pieces that effectively were either shut down or put on hold for the best part of two years are now scrambling mm. to get back up and running. So, you know, we've all got to work hard to get this thing back in. And you've got a situation where demand is stronger than any of us expected. And you might say, well, gee, you should have forecasted that. Well, it's interesting. I was reflecting on this the other day. Two aspects. The first one is actually this time last year, we were still running a five-stage border reopening plan for New Zealand. Mm. Omicron was was reasonably rampant. We had a very small domestic business, no international flying at all apart from cargo and repatriation. And the message was borders don't fully reopen until October. Mm. The second thing that I would remind all of us on is that we'd gone through a period where any international travel, and there wasn't much, but there was some, was going through a start, pause, stop, restart, pause, stop. And so when we spoke to customers, they said to us, you know, when the borders do open, we're, we're a bit hesitant. Mm -hmm. We're not sure whether we're going to be stuck overseas. We're not sure how this whole COVID thing plays out. We're not sure we're going to be doing it much international travel. Mm -hmm. Now, it's turned out we, we got that wrong, didn't we? Because basically, as soon as we got to May, which is when we opened to all visa waiver countries, everyone went, whoosh, we're off. And no one's gone, I'm not sure whether I'm going to get let back in or I'm going to be stuck overseas. And it's because the whole posture around COVID changed. So we got the demand wrong. We've got a supply constraint we're not jacking up prices because we can and all the other stuff. If we tried to to really put a, a lid on it, what would happen is you wouldn't be able to get on a flight if you wanted to at late notice. You could if you booked really early, but if you didn't book early, there wouldn't be enough seats. So we're quite cognizant of that. We're being quite measured. And in time, as we get capacity back, that pricing will come down. Is there also a certain amount of, after you've gone through this period of, as you say, survival, um, and then you have to invest in getting planes back up and running, is there a certain amount of, of getting the books back in the black, it's going to take a little bit of earning more and investing it back into the business? Is that part of it? Yeah, look, I think any business needs to, to have a view to what do you need to do today, but just as importantly, what do you need to do tomorrow? You know, I, I was dealing with a customer this morning who quite rightfully has said to me, I'm disappointed in, in you being me. And he's disappointed in me because he needs to change his flight. And in order to do that, he's got to ring a call center. Now, there are airlines out there Unfortunately, we're not one that have invested in the years in developing the technology in their app that allow so much of the disruption that occurs in airlines to be done self-serve on the app. Mm. So th this is an example where, you know, if you don't need to do something, you can put it off and say, well, you know, we, we can handle it. We've got a call center, ring the call center. Actually, the way of today, not even tomorrow, is customers want to self-serve. Mm. To do that, you've got to invest. So there's an example where, you know, I wish 
I was smart enough three years ago to have said, go out, take several millions of dollars and however many hundreds of people we need, develop this technology, put it onto the app and let people self-serve. Mm -hmm. So I want here New Zealand to invest. I also want them to do a great job of connecting Kiwis, which means keep your prices fair. I want them to look after suppliers. I want them to give a return for shareholders. Mm -hmm. You know, we haven't sorted exactly what we'll do with capital management. We're in discussions with our board about that. But you have to look after all your stakeholders and also your staff. Mm. Okay, so on that then, what are your investment priorities for the medium and long term? What areas of the business are you looking to develop? You know, one of the things we talk about in Air New Zealand is becoming a world-leading digital airline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some things that we've already got underway. We've, we've recently rolled out sort of state-of-the-art navigation systems. So that's very good, not just from, you know, creating the latest tech for pilots to be able to pick the best route to fly, taking into account wind conditions and various other issues but it's also great from a sustainability piece. Mm. Um, we're busy moving all our, our information into the cloud, which is allowing us to now run much better data and analytics. That's a multi-year program, but we're well down the track. We're replatforming our loyalty system. We've just replatformed our app, which will allow us to do some of the things that I just spoke about with relative speed now that we've got that on the latest platform. So one of the things is, world-leading digital airline. Another thing we're working on, transition our wide-body fleet to a single aircraft. So, you know, historically over the years, Air New Zealand has run multiple what we call wide-bodied planes. So these are the two-aisle international planes. Uh, you know, whether they be 747s or 767s or 777s, we, over the next few years, will move to a single 787 fleet. And there's some benefits in doing that. It's a great plane, mm -hmm. but it also allows for simplification. Mm -hmm. So there's another example of investing in, and in, 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 in this case, simplifying. Um, we've just started breaking ground on a new hangar out at the Auckland airport mm -hmm. because we recognise that you know, we need to look after these planes and keep them very operational. The hangar out there was 50 years old, time for a change. So this will become a state-of-the-art hangar. Um, it's a, it's a multi-year program and a multi, there's tens of millions of dollars worth of investment. But give us two to three years, that's going to be a great facility. So those are some of the things where we're looking to, to put back into the business. That's really interesting. And in terms of as well, that investment and in looking to the future, I've heard a lot of chatter about electric planes. It seems to be an area that people are very interested in, but it's complicated and there are varying ways to do it. Is that a live possibility for Air New Zealand? And over what sort of time frame would we be talking about if it is? Yes, it is. And, and you know, I, I think it's one of the more wicked problems that we've got on our agenda, isn't it? You know, how do we deal with this carbon emissions? Mm. Um, and and electric aeroplanes help, but let's put the facts on the table. Mm. Um, there are electric planes out there at the moment. In fact, I've, I've seen one which may well end up um, being one of the first ones that we get into. But here, here, here are the statistics on that plane. It carries nine passengers and two pilots. And that's, that's not going to get the bums on seats that you're looking for. <laughs> right. But like anything, you tend to begin small and then you learn how to grow. But, you know, one of the limiting factors at the moment is the ability to create the right electric engine, mm. taking into account the weight of batteries, which allows you to fly the distance that you need to be able to fly, um, taking into account that you also need an alternate airport should something go wrong. So... Nine seats with two pilots is about the max at the moment. And that, for example, could be something that we may well invest in as early as 2026. And you may be able to fly on it from Hamilton to Auckland. 
That would be nice. I and, would enjoy that. Right. <laughs> now, this is not going to be the enormous revenue generator that, you know, an Airbus, which has got, you know, 230 seats on it. Mm -hmm. But nine seats is the beginning. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at, at hydrogen electric, green hydrogen electric. Mm -hmm. And I've also seen one of these... Um, in Moses Lake in Washington. Is that to help with takeoff? Because I'm told one of the issues is getting enough push for takeoff can be very difficult with electric. Um, well, the issue really with electric comes down just simply to the weight. Right. Um, once you get into hydrogen electric, you're using the hydrogen to then power an electric motor. Mm -hmm. And this particular plane that, that I've seen, which has just recently done a test flight, as I said, in, in Washington State in the United States, and I was there a few months ago. Um, this plane has hydrogen cylinders where there would be some seats in the back of a turboprop plane, and these hydrogen cells fuel an electric engine, happens to be the same electric engine that what I was talking about in the other electric plane. And these can be 40 to 50 seat planes. So we see that as being a viable solution at this stage to replace our Q300 fleet, of which we have 21 of those. So that's probably a 2030 exercise. So 2026, something electric, maybe something hybrid, late. 20s, 2030, probably hydrogen electric, which will allow us to have something a bit more meaningful. No real solution for long haul. So in other words, you want to get to Australia, or I want to get to Japan or the United States. No real solution for that at this point, other than sustainable aviation fuel. Mm. And that's a tough one because it's three to four times the price of fossil fuel. And on a long haul flight, fuel represents about 30% of the cost of the ticket. Mm -hmm. So we could wipe out all profit in Air New Zealand and just use sustainable aviation fuel. Good for carbon emissions, not good for investing in other things in the business. And what's more, you need to be careful that you're not the only one putting sustainable aviation fuel if your competitor is using fossil fuels. People may well say, well, good on Air New Zealand. That's great. You've got a green tick. But why are your fares so expensive? Mm. I think I'll fly with your competitor. So this is why I call it a wicked problem. It's going to require not just ourselves, but the government mm. and other partners to help solve it. Mm. But I do think it's something we're going to need to solve. Well, it's interesting that you mention that in terms of the sustainable fuel driving prices up so much because there has been, I mean, sometimes some commentary I understand can get a little hysterical, but there has been some interesting commentary in terms of whether or not we've passed the peak of travel in terms of these very cheap fares, people casually popping off overseas that maybe we've now seen past the peak of that, whether it's COVID pressures, whether it's climate pressures that these things are changing. What do you think of that commentary? Um, a couple of things. Um, the first thing I'd say is, is that geography is quite important when you think about travel. Mm. And having spent a bit of time in Europe and the United States where there are alternative ways of getting around, such as trains or mm. boats or whatever, um, that creates a different set of circumstances to a country like Australia or New Zealand where if you want to go to New York, you're probably going to fly. Um, or take several months by boat, which not many people are going to. Right. So <laughs> let, let's, let's understand that um, a solution in one area is not necessarily the solution in another. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at this stage... It's really hard to tell exactly what's going to happen here, but maybe what I'm seeing when I'm out and about at the moment is the connection for people face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. family, Fano, mm -hmm. is actually pretty important. And when I look at people wanting to get into the Pacific, into the Cook Islands, into Tonga, Samoa, I watch people at airports going between Australia I see people in New Zealand wanting to connect with family and friends because they haven't seen too much of each other mm 
-hmm. during this period. I think connection, human connection, is as vital today as it's ever been. And people are prepared to trade off some other things to be with family. Mm. So I feel confident that in terms of our domestic business, where there aren't a great number of alternatives for people to connect in this country, and we have a responsibility to do that in a very responsible way, connecting Kiwis with each, with each other. I go, that's a tick. I, I think that's a, a good business to be in. And I think being very selective about what we do internationally is a great business to be in. And we shouldn't forget that we have a responsibility to move, move New Zealand product, cargo. And, you know, during COVID, that was the best part of a billion dollar business for us. So let's not forget how important that is. Now, I've already sent a couple your way. We did invite Shazzy's investors to send in their questions on social media. Had some great questions. So thank you to those who sent those through. I think considering that you've already referenced some of the competition that you will be facing, I think this is a very pertinent one. One investor asked, how do you deal with increasing competition post-COVID from the US and Asia Pacific uh, region more generally? Yeah, um, so a, a couple of ways that we, we deal with that. Uh, one of the obvious ones is that you have alliances and, you know, we're part of the Star Alliance and that means that we have a relationship, for example, with United. They were actually just down here last week and we were discussing how that operates um, and, you know, how do we ensure that we get the right sort of capacity between New Zealand and the US and vice versa. In terms of other competitors, you know, we've got Delta who have announced that they're coming down here in November. They haven't been here before. They're a terrific airline, one of the best in the world. And so we just need to make sure that our product is competitive. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why during, um, you know, the period of COVID, we haven't been sitting on our hands. We've been working out what the next design is going to be like on our wide bodies. What's the new business seat look like? What's the new premium economy seat look like? And hey, presto, you're going to be able to get a live flat option when you're in economy because we've got a sky nest in there that you can rent a bed while you're, while you're flying to the US and back again. So, you know, you've got to compete um, and, and it could be through some of that hard product or it could be through soft product like food and beverage. You know, we launched new food and beverage on all our long haul flights at the end of last year. Brave thing to do when you're restarting an airline, but I'm so pleased we did it. So those are the ways that you, you get out there and compete. It could be through alliance arrangements that you have or making sure that you are up to speed with any of the products, soft or hard, the quality of the planes, your service, uh, and of course, price. Mm. The next question from one of our investors is a bit of a cheeky one. Will you run for prime minister when the CEO gig is over? You know, I've got my hands full at the moment and, and, and I really do. Um, you know, we spoke before about the stages that you go through in this business from sort of survive, revive, thrive. Mm. I want Air New Zealand at the moment to focus on doing some of the basic things extremely well. And, and that is my focus at the moment. I want planes leaving on time, arriving on time, and not losing anything on the way. Um, I want call centres to be answering customer queries as quickly as possible. We want to move to much more of a self-service option for our customers so they're not having to, to deal with us and contact us all the time. So I've got my hands full at the moment and that's my focus and that's what I've got to do. Uh, it's what I know our customers expect us to do and our staff. So that's where my attention is. I've got to say that is a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> Maybe there is a future in politics. <laughs> um, I, as I said, I got a job to do, and that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so, in terms of what you've been doing during these COVID survive years, now you're moving into the thrive phase. People will surely notice something different when they are flying with you. 
What are they going to notice rolling out? Yeah, look, we've got a few things that are actually getting close to coming to fruition. One of them is, you know, we've got this new foundation on the app. How do we now start to add more enhancements to that that could be really customer focused, like, for example, tracking your baggage? So I think that's probably only a few months away before we'll actually start to roll a feature out like that. So that builds into the whole digital component. The team are busy working on revising the seats to suit products. So that's a product that goes between sort of Auckland and the ta across the Tasman to Australia. And what are we doing there in terms of that particular product for the customer? So they're busy working on that. We've got a pretty significant um, retrofit program on our 787 fleet. And we're also considering what we want to do with our 777 fleet. So the 777 fleet's a bit older. So what do we need to do just to freshen those planes up? For the 787s, it would actually be getting um, the same layout that we would put on our new planes, which are due to arrive in about two years' time progressively. So lots and lots of things happening. Yeah, I'll say a bit on the plate there. I mean, it's it's a rare one because on this podcast, you're speaking fairly directly to retail investors. So is there a, a bottom line or a main takeaway that you would like to say to those listening at the moment? Um, yeah, I, th I think that um, you should feel pretty confident about Air New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, I do. And our team do. We've thought really carefully about our plan for this business. It's, it's called KMO, where we're uh, quite public about what it means. You know, um, we want to take our domestic business and grow it. Mm. We want to optimize our international business. We want to lift our loyalty business. And we're going to do that by being brilliant at the basics, mm. um, by becoming a world-leading digital airline. Um, by making sure that we lead on sustainability and finally our people and safety continue to be developed and enhanced. So it's a, it's a really clear plan. Everyone in Air New Zealand, all 10 and a half, almost 11,000 of us buy into this and we know what we're doing. So we're encouraged by the fact we've got a good plan. We're encouraged by the momentum that we're getting in the business now in the thrive phase. We know what we want to do. We've got the resources to do it. We've got a good balance sheet. And, um, you know, we're going to get on and execute this. So feel good about the business. We do. And um, we're here for the long term. I've got to say, as your typical millennial who hates picking up the phone and calling people, I'm very excited, particularly about these app changes. It all sounds very exciting. Thanks very much for coming in today, Greg. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. And thank you, everyone who's tuned in. Really appreciate your time and, of course, Greg's insights. Now, we do have a special offer for Sharesies investors from Business Desk. If you use the promo code SHAREDLUNCH2023, that's all one word, SHAREDLUNCH2023, you'll get $100 off an annual subscription to Business Desk, which is usually $249, including GST. Now, the offer only applies to new Business Desk subscribers, can only be used once per subscriber, and can't be used with any other discounts. Enjoy the rest of your week. Do stay safe.